the idea that the invisible hand of the market representing the enlightened self-interest of many, many people is an honest broker and can effectively allocate and efficiently allocate resources uh, in the marketplace uh, is flawed if the invisible hand is blind. Now, what blinds the invisible hand so that it cannot see the consequences of its own action? It is the externalities. It is the fact that the prices are not honest prices. There's a price of a pack of cigarettes established by the market in its wisdom reflect its cost. Well, of course not, nowhere near considering the societal cost. There's a price of a barrel of oil established by the market in its wisdom reflect its cost. Of course not. I mean, the military power in the Middle East is $100 a barrel if it's a penny and you throw in the, the occasional Gulf War. So you know that the price of a barrel of oil nowhere near reflects its cost. And if the invisible hand is guided by dishonest prices, it cannot reach dishonest, it cannot reach honest conclusions. So, how do you get the prices right? There is a role undoubtedly for the government to play in internalizing the externalities to get the prices right. And we come to the idea of tax shifts as the available mechanism that an enlightened government could exercise. It could exercise its power of taxation and redress the dishonesty in the marketplace. The corporation also is people. And people, by and large, want to do the right thing. They really do. And those people that make up the corporation are responding to other people who make up the marketplace. And when those people, the marketplace, insist on responsible business practices, the people inside those businesses will respond. They must respond or they risk losing the business, the confidence of, of the marketplace. There is no more fundamental thing than trust between buyer and seller in creating an honest marketplace. Corporations cannot afford to violate that trust. They do right and left and they pay the price. And as, as a more enlightened public arises, a more enlightened electorate arises, the corporate leader and the politician will have to respond. I'm actually in favor, not of more government regulation, but I'm in favor of more innovation. More innovation in, uh, in, in creating a system that gets the priorities right, that internalizes the externality on its own, that depends ultimately on an informed marketplace. People insisting that the products that they buy be made responsibly by corporations that are acting responsibly. That will drive corporations to do the right thing. Government has another role too. Government has a role to play through its taxation policy to help get the prices right. You know, today we tax labor. You know, something we'd really like to encourage, job creation, but we tax it. And we let off scot-free the uh, exploitation of nature. How, how much sense does it make? How, how much sense it does make to shift taxes, to penalize the things we don't want, and relieve taxes on the things we do want and get the incentives right to get rid of the perverse subsidies that exist. So that, in my mind, is where the government's attention needs to be focused, not on more regulations, but on getting rid of the perverse subsidies. How to do well and do good at the same time is the challenge. Doing well by doing good. We have learned in our business that it's a positive feedback loop. It really is possible to do well and to do good, and to do more well and to do more good. The, better, the more good we do, the more well we do, the more well we do, the more good we do. It's a positive, positive feedback loop. It works this way. Our customers embrace what we're doing because they see us trying to do the right thing. 
Now, if, if our words get ahead of our deeds, we risk breaching that trust. So we have to be very careful to avoid greenwash, talking about it but not doing it or claiming more than we're doing. Uh, but when our customers embrace what we're doing and honor us with the business, that's the direct top line benefit. You can't beat it. All the advertising in the world is not as good as the customer being predisposed because they trust you. You get the business, and if you're more resource efficient in pursuing the other, uh, the other aspects of sustainability, you bring more of that to the bottom line. Now, when that happens, other companies say, who are these guys? What's going on there? What are they doing different? And when they come to us and ask us, we're more than happy to show them exactly what we're doing. And you know what? They become customers. And we're back at the top line again. And the positive feedback loop builds. The idea that, that business operates in its own self-interest needs to be modified. You know, that is an enlightened self-interest. Enlightened self-interest dictates a different attitude toward, toward some things, like regulations are all you have to do. Regulations really translate into, you know, as bad as the law allows. That's not good enough, and, and the public knows that's not good enough. The marketplace knows that's not good enough. So as bad as the law allows, uh, as bad as the law allows, is giving way to beyond regulation, beyond compliance. And if, if, if the marketplace accepts and rewards this, that's the incentive that will move business more rapidly, further beyond compliance. In nature, there's no waste. So let's model a company after nature, a waste-free company, where emissions are harmless. So that whatever we do emit is, is not going to harm any creature, any, any part of the biosphere. Let's drive our processes with renewable energy, but let's first reduce that energy usage to its irreducible minimum through efficiencies relentless pursuit of efficiency so that we can begin to afford the investments in the renewable sources of energy, photovoltaics, wind, biomass, fuel cells someday, so that someday we can, instead of sending carpet to a landfill, we can mine the landfill and bring those old carpets back and salvage the petrochemical molecules and give them life after a true resurrection, if you will. We've planted 30,000 trees at this, you know, this moment, by the, at this point in time, offsetting lots of miles in commercial jets. We can see the day when we will no longer sell our products, but we will sell the service that our product provides. In carpet, that means color and texture and ambiance, comfort underfoot, acoustical value, cleanliness, functionality, all the reasons people want carpet, they can buy that service instead of owning the product itself. We retain ownership in the means of delivering the service. Now, why is that good for the environment? You can bet that if we own that product, we will make it to last. We will maintain it to last so that those molecules through their first life have a maximum life. And then we will also, at the end of that life, bring those products back and give them life after life. And to take it a step further, we'll design them in the first place so that they easily disassemble into their components to make it even easier to bring those materials back and close the loop on the individual material components. <laughs>